And now on Radio Flange Goblet, it's the After Movie Diner, the show which the Des Moines Observer called the best case for euthanasia yet. After all, the crab was cold, rubbery, and lacking in class. The Boston Gazette said there are many things I dislike more than the After Movie Diner, but luckily they don't bother me unless I poke them with a stick, which is exactly the opposite of the After Movie Diner. And the Alabama Review of Bathtub said, while lacking in polish, style, or charm, the Wentworth 4800 Tubette is a perfect water receptacle and not problematic if you're bathing a small dog or a simple child. As a podcast, though, it's a fucking disgrace. Well, hello again, diners, and welcome to another episode of the After Movie Diner. And this week, it is a very special episode as we are focusing on the latest indie film to come out, uh, The Big Ask, uh, which is available on video on demand in the States currently on Amazon and Hulu and Time Warner Cable and various different places. Um, So please do check that out. And it is going to have a selected theatrical release beginning May 30th, um, which is obviously at the end of this week. So if you're in one of the bigger cities, I'm sure you'll be able to find it playing at a local cinema. Um, So I would check it out. Uh, It's directed by Thomas Beatty and Rebecca Fishman, who are first-time married directors. Um, It's written by Thomas and featuring Gillian Jacobs, uh, Zachary Knighton, David Krumholz, Melanie Linsky, uh, Anna O'Reilly, Jason Ritter, Ned Beatty, Dale Dickey, and French Stewart. Um, Later on in the show, we're going to be talking to uh, David Krumholz and uh, Jason Ritter, both about the film, their characters, as well as some other stuff. I speak to David about one of his uh, new ventures, which is weatherfrom.com. And I also talked to him about Serenity and Freaks and Geeks and Harold and Kumar and things like that. So uh, any fan of David's, please do keep listening. A fantastic interview with both him and Jason Ritter uh, coming up later in the show. Thank you all so much for being so great about everything. Ah, hey! We are here for you. We love you, man. There is a reason I asked you all to come. To a vacation. To not dying of cancer. To no one else dying of cancer. Here, here. What I really want is to have sex with everyone here. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) It's not a joke. I mean, his mom died of horrible cancer. You know, and now he wants to use that opportunity to sleep with his friend's girlfriend. And you're just cool with that? Absolutely not. I don't like it here. I don't suppose you have an answer for me about that other thing. Have you ever taken a shower with him? Why are we even talking about this? I'm feeling really misunderstood right now. (laughs) You do realize that if you do this, I will never, ever forgive you. Dude, those are too big! There are no rules in a rock fight. (gasps) He's not dying. He doesn't have cancer. This is the worst idea ever. of nervous breakdown. It's called life. Okay, so you just heard the trailer. Uh, The official synopsis of the film reads that three couples head to the desert to help their friend, played by David Krumholz, heal after the death of his mother. But when they learn that his idea of healing is asking to sleep with his best friend's girlfriends at the same time, his ludicrous request creates fallout amidst the entire group. Uh, It describes itself as a hilariously dark comedy about the things we do for friends in need. Basically, the film takes place over a weekend. They stay in these desert cabins. It's sort of very near to Joshua Tree uh, in California. And there are three guys, three girls. We don't entirely know uh, their relationships or what they do for work. Um, but we know that they've all been helping um, David Krumholz's character out after the death of his mother from uh, cancer, as you heard in the trailer. And then on the first night that they're there, Uh, Much to the embarrassment and humor to everyone who's there, David makes the big uh, statement that he would like to sleep with all the women present, including his own girlfriend. And what this really does is this starts a a roller coaster of events which cause each couple to kind of examine their relationships as much as it does cause each couple to examine David's quest. So 
he sort of puts the cat amongst the pigeons in that respect, or, or certainly the, the, the question does. Coupled with this, uh, David has a, or David's character, Alan, has a rather charming relationship with the guy who owns and runs the cabins. Uh, clearly, it's not the first time they've been out there. He's played by French Stewart, and uh, he is, is a character in the movie where you sort of see that other people maybe understand Alan, David's character, uh, uh, better than his close friends do or seemingly do in that sort of way that strangers sometimes do and sometimes get it and sometimes, you know, they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to go in depth with it. They don't want to have to whatever. But but there is a nice little charming relationship there, which is very cool. Uh, there is an old guy who comes looking for his dog, which has gone astray, which Alan has sort of uh, kidnapped slightly and put in one of the adjacent cabins. Uh, and that is played by uh, the director's father, Ned Beatty, the, the famous and fantastic actor Ned Beatty. And that's about it in terms of characters. In terms of plot, I don't think you need to know anything else before we go over to the interview. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, roll the interview with actor, writer, producer, director and comedian David Krumholtz. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, so what first drew you to the project, The Big Ask, or how did it come to you? What drew me to it was that it was sort of a brutally awkward comedy that didn't pull any punches in its awkwardness. In other words, there were no sort of uh, polished elements to it. It was what it was. And I thought that the more awkward it got, the more brilliant uh, it would play on a big screen. And when they asked me to play that role, the lead role, I thought, well, this is an opportunity of a lifetime because um, it's such a he's such a strange character going through such a weird point in his life on film. Uh, and I thought, wow, you know, I can really bring life to it. I I had some personal experiences that that I that I could relate to the character with, and and so yeah, I uh, I jumped at the chance. Excellent. No, it was it was fantastic. And um, you started your career on the stage, and The Big Ask is obviously a small cast and a script that is both wordy but also silent at times and about the moments and the blocking and the looks and so on. Uh, did you did it have a play feel about it when you were putting it together? Oh, wow, that's interesting. You know, it might have. I mean, it's very, very subtle and quiet. So in that sense, it didn't, in the sense that we didn't, you know, project. There's... There's only a few sort of climactic and, for lack of a better word, broad moments in the film where the where sort of the tensions between the characters explode. And other than that, it is a film of silences and 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 you know you know muttered feelings and um, and and that's that's kind of what it was going for. So I guess the answer is yes and no, um, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it definitely, whatever it felt like, there was tremendous chemistry between the actors. And I think the as we filmed the, the movie, I think we all, even Thomas Beatty and Rebecca Fishman, uh, who were directing it, sort of, we all discovered what the film was as we were making it. And, yeah. and, and, and I guess tonally, yeah. Yeah, no, completely. I was going to ask about what it was like sort of working with the rest of the cast, I agree with you that the chemistry in the film is fantastic. Um, it really is. And you do completely understand where everyone's coming from. Did you know a lot of them beforehand or was it everyone's sort of first time working together? No, I'd never met any of them before. Uh, I think Gillian and, and uh, Melanie Linsky had known each other from before. I think they'd made a, another film together. But uh, no, I don't think any of us, other than that, I don't think any of us knew each other. We were all in a very precarious position, way out uh, in the heart of the Mojave Desert, mm. an hour past Joshua Tree National Park. And we were all living together. This was a super low budget indie, uh, no frills. Um, and, and so I think we were forced to get along, basically. <laughs> it was like almost like a giant experiment. Yeah. The great thing was, from day one, we all were very much on the same page, not only as actors, and in reference to this particular project, but as people, I think uh, 
he happened to, you know, Rebecca and Thomas either got lucky or purposely put together a cast of very similar like-minded individuals. And so it was lovely. I mean, it was three weeks in paradise, even though we were in the middle of a very, you know, sort of deserted uh, um, um, landscape. We, I think we all felt, you know, we all had a, a ton of fun making this film and we all put our hearts and souls into it. It was kind of nice to get away from L.A. and and, you know, you know, have this little tiny project to work on that no one knew we were working on. And uh, I don't think any of us um, knew that it would be as well received as it's been. And we're, I, we're all just thrilled about that. It's icing on the cake. Yeah, of course. Is, is it a landscape or an area or a part of the country that you personally enjoy? Or did you have to kind of come to terms with being out in the desert like that? <laughs> uh, honestly, I don't enjoy it. No, it's it's. I I'm a city boy, so I like noise. Uh, I like I like distraction. Uh, yeah. And and really, there's not much of that in the desert. It's, the desert is a place of self reflection, and you better be ready to self reflect um, if you're going to go out there. And perhaps uh, I wasn't. And so there were some difficult moments for me in making the film. I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I, but, 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 you know, those, those five other actors got me through it. And, you know, Thomas Baby and Rebecca Fishman got me through it. And, and, uh, it was, it ended up being sort of the, one of the more, um, fanciful and whimsical experiences of my, of my acting career in my life. So I, I, I really, it was three weeks that I wish I could, you know, have back. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I was going to say you've been acting a long time. You're obviously very prolific, and the character you play this time is sort of very raw and, in a way, confrontational, but also shy. There's sort of a nice balance. Uh, were there new challenges you faced on the big ask as an actor that you hadn't faced before? Well, um, that's a good question. I, I, I think I wanted to do something simple. Uh, I wanted to do something that wasn't so on the nose. I figured, you know, the script was so well, wit well written that I figured if I just trusted the text uh, and and just not try too hard at any moment, that that would create a profundity and an impact in my performance. Um, and I think it did. That was scary in the sense that, you know, I think an artist's instinct is to show is to perform, mm. uh, is to push themselves out there. And in this one, it's, I almost had to hold back a lot. And simpler and smaller was always better. And I think there were times where Thomas and Rebecca really responded to that, and other times where they were worried that that, that wouldn't work either. Um, but, you know, we worked on it together, and those are the choices we made. Mm. Um yeah, and and I, so I think if anything was difficult about it from that, from from an acting perspective, it, it was knowing when to hold back. Right. Okay. And uh, in fact, that leads on nicely because I was going to say you've been in a, a fair few comedies, obviously, and and I often have the comedic or interesting character within a film. How important is comedy to you? And how, with a film like The Big Ask, which on the surface appears to have quite a comedic premise. Did you find the balance and give Andrew, your character, a sort of serious and sympathy? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, um, I, I think at its heart, this is a drama, believe it or not. I mean, I think it's being sold as a comedy, and certainly there are comedic elements. And it's a great crowd film. It's a great sort of laugh under your under your breath, you know, yeah. uh, giggle at these people's misfortunes film. That being said... Um, I do think that it plays as a drama. I agree. Um, yeah, I do agree. Yeah, and and because it really is about the sort of reaffirmation of of, of all of the characters' values, and um, you know, for me, comedy and drama, there's never been too much of a divide. I mean, honestly, I, I think there's I think there's great laughs to be derived from human frailty. And call it Schadenfreude or whatever you want. That to me is 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 a great place to start from for comedy. And and the, the, what's opposite is true too. You know, people's effort to be funny in a weird way is 
or in a very obvious, sometimes very opaque way, is a, a, a way to sort of mask pain. And um, and so for me as an actor, I've never really wanted to be declaratively one thing or the other, a dramatic actor or a comedic actor. Right. So in this particular case, I got the chance to just go with how I felt at any given moment with the understanding that there were moments that needed to be funny um, and why they were funny. But I'm a student of comedy, comedy just like anybody else. I'm no expert, and uh, and uh, it, it's, it was just fun to experiment. Yeah, I thought you brought great sympathy to the character, a character that could quite easily have not been sympathetic because of what he's asking and how he's behaving. So I, I think the... The sympathy that you have with the character and the, the seriousness you were able to bring to, like I say, what could have been quite comedic but is more dramatic was uh, was really good. Enjoyed that a lot. Um, so you got a chance on this film to to work with um, the legend Ned Beatty. What was what was working with him like? Just I imagine just on those couple of scenes. Well, you know, Ned is Thomas Beatty's father, so it was it was a great honor to work with him uh, and get the chance to do it. Uh, it was lovely to see a son work with his father. Yeah. Um, I think I was so happy for Thomas that day or those couple of days because you know, he got to be around his dad and, and do something creative with his dad. And I'll tell you, Ned showed up with so many ideas and was so professional and so immersed in who his character was. Uh, it was really, he put on a clinic. I think all of us just kind of watched in amazement. Um, it's it's just cool. It's always cool to be around an actor of that ilk um, with with as much experience as he has behind him. Um, just to see the ease in which he does what he does, uh, the believability. He doesn't have to work at anything. It's just there. It's on the surface, and it comes. He's a, you know what he is is he's a fine tuned instrument, mm. and um, and it was just it was really cool to watch. It was great great to have that experience with him. Yeah. And the, the big ask is from a first time directing team, um, obviously, as someone who's worked on multiple film sets. Uh, what are the benefits of that? What are the challenges of that? And did you learn anything new from sort of seeing filmmaking through fresh eyes? Well, I've, I've done a bunch of films, actually, with first-time filmmakers. It's actually one of more, my more favorite things to do in life, mm. <laughs> even though sometimes it can be extremely, excruciatingly painful. Um, <laughs> in this case, it wasn't. Uh, I, I really love making a film where there's nobody that's jaded or above the content or sort of, um, you know, thinking about their next project while they're making this one. Mm. I, I love the earnestness and the enthusiasm that first-time writers and directors bring to projects. I like the desperation. Um, I love being part of that. I love making, you know, a director's uh, or a writer's dream come true. Um, and because that's what a first film is. It's like a first child. It's, it's, it's you know, it's a dream come true. Yeah. Uh, and it's a big deal. And so I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoy working on films like that. And in this case, in specific, Thomas Beatty and I became fast friends. And, uh, and you know, I'm just so happy for him uh, that the movie is being well received because he did write a wonderful script. And him and his wife, Rebecca, poured their heart and soul into this. And, and it deserves to be seen and to be given the, uh, the, uh, you know, the accolades that it's, it's received. Yeah, most definitely. And I like the way how at the end of it, it doesn't nail anything on the head, but at the same time, I think especially if you've been through, like you were saying earlier, you had personal things you could draw from. Uh, if you've been through similar sort of situations or similar pain, I think you completely understand it at the end, and I I, I enjoyed that about it, 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 it greatly. Um, so uh, we also wanted to... Oh, no, 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 not at all. It was great. Uh, we also wanted to talk to you today about your new performance as Gigi on the new comedy website, weatherfrom.com. I've seen the clip, and it's certainly a new role for you. Um, tell our listeners what it's about and about your involvement in it. Mm -hmm. Weatherfrom.com is a comedic weather website. We all have to go on the Internet now, and, and if we want to know the, mo the most up-to-the-moment weather forecast for our small towns or for a town we're traveling to or from. And, 
and so my friends thought, well, why not, uh, why not do something, you know, because those websites are so boring. Right. You're just getting information. Why not you know, have a laugh when you're, uh, when, you're, when you're on those websites? So they thought, hey, why don't, we have, why don't we film a bunch of vignettes and have a bunch of characters read you the weather? Um, and what they settled on was this one character uh, who is, you know, an old lady with a lot of attitude and a filthy mouth. And, you know, potentially, you know, a little sexually promiscuous. And she <laughs> is, um, she's going to tell you the weather and tell you what the weather reminds her of and maybe tell you some other random stuff that you really don't want to know. Um, but it's all very funny. We filmed 35 vignettes for 35 different types of weather. Weather, They range from 30 seconds to two minutes in length. And, um, you know, they're, they're everything from... Uh, talking about how she would like to have sex with Jeff Goldblum to <laughs> how she claims she's the only survivor of the space shuttle Challenger disaster. Um, <laughs> she is a really uh, spirited older lady that I got to play. I based it on my grandmother, who was that. She was very, very loud, very obnoxious, very opinionated, and very, very, very funny. Um, and so we got the, uh, they reached out to me, asked me to do it. They then got the guys from Alterian Inc. who did, uh, who were just recently nominated for their makeup work on uh, Bad Grandpa, nominated for an Academy Award, and uh, they signed on. They agreed to do it, and before you know it, they transformed me into someone who whose picture even fooled my own family. When I showed them the picture of Gigi, they didn't know who that was, and I had to say, that's me. Uh, <laughs> it was fascinating and fun, and I'd much rather be her than myself. She's, she's an awesome character to play. Yeah. And we really hope people respond to her, you know. And, you know, it works like any other weather website. You go on there, you type in a zip code or the name of any city in the world, and it will tell you the accurate weather, or she will tell you the accurate weather. You can also go on and and uh, click random forecast, and that will tell you, you can watch as many of her videos as you'd like. Right, I see. And I was going to ask, actually, sort of what kind of input did you have into it? Obviously, you're saying it's based on uh, your own grandmother. And what was it like to work with such an extensive makeup? Uh, it, was, it was great. It took four and a half hours. Um, it was so transformative. It was such a freeing, awesome experience for me as an actor, to be honest with you. Yeah. I became her. I didn't want to be anybody but her while I was in her skin. It, it fascinated me that she looked so real up close that people couldn't see me anymore when they looked directly at me. Yeah. And that yeah. was fascinating to me and just, you know, you know, immersed me even further into her into her consciousness, into who she is. And for four and a half hours, I was a different person. It was an amazing escape. Um, so I had so much fun doing that. Uh, you know, a lot of the vignettes were written out by Zach Bold and Ricky Maybe uh, based on their experience with their grandmothers. And then I sort of, uh, you know, embellished where I could uh, with what I knew about my grandmother. So um, the final product is sort of an amalgamation of, of all our thoughts and ideas and yeah. uh, you know she's very the idea was to just make her very real and uh sort of <laughs> very honest um and uh she is that yeah i mean i've heard people like kevin pollock say that he can be funnier when he's doing albert brooks than when he's kevin mm -hmm. pollock and did you find like putting on the the character that that was so that you could kind of say things, do things, be things that you, you wouldn't normally oh, do as yourself. Yeah, Absolutely. You can get away with anything, especially if you're an old person, because, yeah. you know, people, <laughs> people have sympathy for old people, and they also, you know, feel like old people are wise. So you can, and, you know, there's an innocence to, to you know, an earned innocence to being older. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I got away with murder that day, saying things to people I would never say. <laughs> Uh, you know, but, uh, yeah, and that's you, why you know, we're hoping the site does well. Cause I can't, we can't wait to make more. I can't wait to do it again. So, yeah, I was going to ask, is, is it just going to be the one series of things? Do you think you'll take the character and do something else with it? Or what, what are the plans if it's successful? Well, the plan is to expand the website with more characters so that you'll actually have a choice of characters 
uh, to read you your weather. And each character will be as irreverent as Gigi. Nothing on the nose. We're, we're really sort of trying to come up with some really cool ideas, which we have already. And then, of course, we'd like to make more specific weather reports. So instead of there being 35 videos, there'll be 100 with more specific weather and, you know, just as much GG as people can stand. Okay. That's the idea. Okay, great. So uh, do you know sort of where, where – obviously this is going to be available on um, weatherfrom.com if people want to uh, check that out when it, when it finally goes live. And, and where is the, the big ask is played at? Well, it's, it's going to be on video on demand. Okay. So it will be on iTunes and I believe Amazon and maybe Netflix Okay. Uh, starting tomorrow, the 20th, okay. uh, May 20th. And then it will be in select theaters around – um, the country on May 30th. Nice. Okay. Excellent. So obviously you've, you've done a lot of things that have become sort of either cult success or geek success or whatever the, the buzzword is these days. Obviously things like Freaks and Geeks, Undeclared, Firefly, Harold and Kumar, things like that. Um, and I know that my listeners will want to hear about some of those things. So um, what, what was it like, for example, working on Firefly and coming into that, um, coming into Serenity and working, working on that movie with Joss Whedon and the crew and everything? Well, it was a little, uh, it was a little strange, uh, to be honest, because I actually, my scenes were shot on the last two days of shooting of the film. So basically, the principal cast of the film um, had finished uh, their um, their work, and then here came me and my, you know, silly little uh, Mister Universe set uh, yeah. on the last two days. So the crew, I think, was a little tired, and I think they were also a little sad that they had said goodbye to all the principal actors in the film. And uh, and so they were wondering, hey, what, what's this whole thing about? Um, but it was great fun uh, for me. It's a great character. You know, being able to work with Joss was a dream come true. He is a perfectionist in the best sense of the word, and he really um, got a great performance out of me, I think. And... Uh, and I just had a blast working with him. But it was only two days of shooting. Uh, I was in and I was out. And, uh, and yeah, that, that was the extent of that experience. Okay. And with the Harold and Kumar films, it feels like everyone kind of knows each other and they're all friends and it's, it's sort of little comedy cameos and things like that. Is that the case? Or um, was it just another job that you got that happened to reoccur? Uh, well, at first it was, yeah, I guess you could say it was that, but it became very familial, uh, quickly. Uh, you know, the writers, the Hayden Schlossberg and John Hurwitz yeah. became fast friends of mine. Uh, I had actually known Eddie K. Thomas, who plays Rosenberg for a very long time, and we were very close friends. So it was easy for us to just sort of slip into those characters, uh, not to mention that he and I were have a lot in common with those characters, or at least at the time we did. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, it's kind of easy. And, and uh, that was just, those films are just a blast to make. Yeah. They're so ridiculous, you know. Yeah. And with, um, uh, do, you, do you still get people coming up and talking about, like, Freaks and Geeks and Undeclared, your, your spots on those shows? And what were they like to work on very quickly? Yeah, uh, you know, people, people come up to me all the time and, and because Freaks and Geeks is such a big cult show. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, again, it was a quick job. Uh, I had a lot of fun. Um, you know, I, I, that show is so good. And, you know, I knew we were making something really special and, and any time, you know, you get to work with someone like Judd Apatow, you know, it's, it's, it's a special experience. Uh, and, un, you know, they both, unfortunately, you know, were canceled before they were really, you know, they really came to prominence, which they, you know, they should have given, been given a chance. And what's great is that they've become such huge cult hits and uh, it's cool to be any part of something like that. Yeah, I mean, it, with with those two and Firefly, it's kind of the trifecta of shows that people wish wish hadn't been um, cancelled before the time. But uh, okay, so just before we finish up, then what have you got coming up uh, in the future? What can people expect uh, apart from weather from dot com? Um, well, right now uh, there's a movie coming out at the end of the year called The Judge with Robert Downey Jr. and Robert Duvall, and I have a little small part in that. Um, but what I'm most excited about is um, I'm doing a animated film for Sony with Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg called Sausage Party, and it's basically a filthy, filthy version of Toy Story about <laughs> uh, about food items in a supermarket yeah. and talking food 
Talking Food, and uh, I'm very, very, very excited about that. I can't wait for people to see it. It's hilarious. Yes, because you're in This is the End as well, aren't you? So, I mean, it, that yeah. I imagine that friendship from Freaks and Geeks has continued then, and uh, you'll work with them again in the future. Yeah, right? yeah they're, they're, they're probably my best friends in the whole world. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, look, thanks ever so much, David. I wish um, the big ask uh, all, all the success it can get, as uh, as I do weatherfrom.com. Can't wait to see all the vignettes on that as well. Um, and thanks so much for giving us the time. It's my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, so wasn't that cool? You heard David Crumholtz there talking about the big ask, weatherfrom.com, and a few other of his career highlights. So what a great interview. What a nice chap. Very cool that he did that. Uh, another great chap coming up, uh, Jason Ritter, um, son to the uh, late and great John Ritter, uh, who I personally loved in Real Men. That was my John Ritter movie of choice. But uh, Jason Ritter, who's a fantastic actor in his own right, has done some great work, is coming up next on the show. Howdy, folks. Got blood, violence, freaks and nature. You come to the right place. My name is Gary, and I'm your guide to the Cinema Beef Podcast. Every episode, we not only deliver film reviews, we also dismantle some of your favorite and most hated films, sometimes for the better and sometimes for the worse. Hey, 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 you shut your face! If we want to hear you talk, I will shove my arm up your ass and work your mouth like a puppet! All right, calm down, calm down. Every show I hope to have a new co-host, podcasters, listeners alike. That's right, I'm talking to you people. I take all comers. Oh, slaps. That's not very nice. The only rules, well, let's ask the best cooler in the business. All you have to do is follow three simple rules. One, never underestimate your opponent. Expect the unexpected. Two, take it outside. Never start anything inside the bar unless it's absolutely necessary. And three, be nice. So join the insanity and please vent your frustrations. I'm available on TalkShoe, iTunes, and Stitcher Smart Radio. And remember, here at the Sin Beef Podcast, if you got beef, I've got the grinder. Hey, Iris, you know what we should do? We should try to get Fred Olin Ray on the show. Why would he want to come on our show? Hi, this is Fred Olin Ray, and you're listening to the Badasses Boobs and Body Count Podcast. Okay, what about Olaf Ittenbach, Germany's Splatter King? Ah, uh, that'd be great, but I doubt he speaks any English. I'm Olaf Hittenbach, and you're listening to the Badasses, Boobs, and Body Count Podcast. What about the director of Blood Sucking Freaks, Joel M. Reed? Isn't he dead? This is Joel M. Reed, and you're listening to Badass Boobs and Body Counts Podcast. No, Iris, he's not. Hello, I'm Mike, host to the Badasses Boobs and Body Counts Podcast. And I'm Iris, co-host of the Badasses Boobs and Body Counts Podcast. Every week in High Iris discuss lesser-known action, exploitation, and horror cult cinema. Mike and I discuss films like The Black Godfather, The Beast That Killed Women, and Biozombie, to name just a few. And every now and then we get to speak with the people behind all the films we love to talk about. Okay, how about this, Mike? Let's get Andy Sidaris on the show and talk girls, guns, and G-strings. Um, yeah, Iris, he's actually really dead, but we did manage to talk to his wife, Arlene, way back in episode 20. Well, I suppose that's the next best thing. Yeah, I suppose so. So the Badasses Boobs and Body Counts podcast can be found on iTunes, on Stitcher's Smart Radio, and on SoundCloud. Just search for the BBNBC podcast to start listening today. You can also visit the show's website at badassesboobsandbodycounts.com. Okay, Iris, did you keep track of the boob and body counts on the film we're discussing next week? Uh, no, I thought you were doing that this week. No, I'm no, I no, uh-uh. no. I've seen this. Uh, boy, no, it we're was have, you. It was you. Uh, look, from now on, let's both do that. Okay, that sounds good. Now, a little bit about Jason's interview. Unfortunately, there was a bad phone connection. So uh, while I have tried to clean it up as best as possible, uh, you will notice a few sort of breaks and and cracks here and there. I apologize for that. Like I said, we did do our very best, and Jason was very, very patient. Um, But due to technical issues, uh, this next interview is not as smooth as I personally would like. But I hope you still get uh, tons from it and still enjoy it. So... Let's uh, go over now and speak to Jason Ritter. Mm-hmm. 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 
Hi, Jason. How are you today, sir? Good. How are you? I'm very good, sir. Just wanted to ask then, what first drew you to the project, The Big Ask, or how did it come to you? I, I received this script, and, um, you know, I started reading it, and, and uh, I, you know, began, and I thought, okay, you know, six people in a house who all really cared about each other, and, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of was intrigued. I thought the writing was good, but then the moment where the character of Andrew asks the big question... Uh, at that point, I I realized that there, you know, if someone came up to me and said, "I'll give you twenty thousand dollars to put that script down and never find out what happens," I, I, you know, I wouldn't have been able to. I I was so intrigued. I I really wanted to find out how it ended, how it all shook down in this group of friends, and uh, and it was the kind of thing where you know. I, I saw some of the actors who were attached to it, and it was really exciting to me. of people that I'd wanted to work with for a long time, and uh, it just seemed like I, I read it and I wanted to jump into this world. I think that there were parts of it that, that were confusing to me and scary to me, and it was like, it, it, to me, it felt like I, I was just so intrigued by it. I wanted to jump in the middle and sort of figure it out how this could happen and how this would affect a group of friends. And, um, uh, yeah, it just, it, it, I, I thought the script was wonderful and unlike anything I had ever read before. And, um, it was exciting. And how is it like working with the rest of the cast? Did you know any of them beforehand? Cause the chemistry is on screen between the group of you is fantastic. How did you all work on that? Uh, I knew David Crumholz a little bit. Uh, Melanie and I had a bunch of mutual friends and we had met several times but didn't really know each other that well and Gillian and I had met a couple of times. I had never met Anna or, or Zach before. But one of the cool things is that uh, about the way that they sort of put this together is Thomas and Rebecca put Zach and David and I in a house together for the entirety of the shoot and Melanie and Anna and Gillian in the house together. And so um, that helped us all create this this group of friends. We all spent a lot of time together. You know, when we weren't in the guy's house or the women's house hanging out and watching movies and having fun, we were all stuck in the, the shooting house together. And so, you know, and, and I think it also just had to do with we had a bunch of actors who were game to sort of jump into this and you know no one was sort of aloof or off to the side everyone was in the middle of it we all were getting to know each other we all were kind of falling in love with each other you know as we were shooting and um it was it, it was a real special a really special time um for all of us and you know i think that one of the things that we all understood about the script in the movie was that if if these characters don't love each other and really care about each other, it, it doesn't work. It just becomes about a sleazy guy who wants to break rules and have a, a foursome and, and not about a, a guy who needs, who really believes that he needs to be healed and this is the only way to do that and five people who really love and care about this guy. So it was it was really helpful to be able to get to know everybody. And one of the things that I was concerned about was uh, Andrew, the David's character, that you know that he would come off in a in an awful way, and that the audience wouldn't like him. And I think it's it's sort of a, a magic part of, of who David Grumholtz is and his performance in that movie, where. You know, he believes it so much, and he's so vulnerable, and it, it like, you know, you you believe that even if it's misguided or it's wrong, that that he believes it, and that it's it's not just some uh, shallow ploy to to get the thing that he wants by using, you know, death and his family. Exactly, I think it all comes across that you know what you're talking about, Andrew's sensitivity and the chemistry between the cast and all that, it all comes across really nicely in the film, and uh, no one comes across looking too much of a villain, although I suppose that's mostly your character in a strange way, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, at the end of it, yeah, my my character is the one who who sort of does this awful thing, and it's been it's been really interesting to sort of take it around to festivals and things like that, and have different people's reactions to it. Um, you know, some really come away feeling like I was a, a villain. Others understand, you know, that I that you know he was put in an awful situation that hit him in all of the deepest insecurities and and also the thing of you know when someone removes the the, the some of the rules and the boundaries that that sort of we've all agreed as a society governs our relationships when those boundaries are gone all of a sudden it becomes everything becomes uh, up for grabs and and questionable and and if and if Andrew is allowed to heal his pain outside of his relationship, and who's to say that his girlfriend can't do that as well, or that Owen can't do that as well? And um, you know, I mean, the thing is, I feel like it's 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 these people who love each other who are put in this situation, and then it, it's all Andrew's character doesn't realize necessarily how much of a tailspin it, it, his question puts this group of friends in. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, for the most part, it's everyone just trying to, uh, to figure it out and try to help him and, and help themselves. But but yeah, it, it's an interesting thing when, when someone decides I'm going to, I know it's selfish, I know it's weird, uh, that this is a question that I'm asking and no one's going to be forced to, but I'm not going to back down from um, from asking for what I want. And all of a sudden, it gives everybody the, you know, maybe a bit of feeling to be selfish. Yeah, no, I was going to ask, so what was it like shooting out in the desert like that? Is the landscape or area of the country that you enjoy? Yeah, I, I I do enjoy it. I did enjoy it. You know, I, I, I think that especially in a movie like this, it really it was almost a, a, a seventh character in the movie. It's it's so barren, and there's it makes the situation even more of a of a pressure. There's there's nothing else to to focus on. Um, you know, I don't I don't think this would be the same movie if it was placed on the floor in a casino or something like that, where there's distractions all over the place. That the you know. Here they all are. They're isolated. It's hot. You know, it makes everybody a little bit more. It forces everybody to deal with it a little bit more. And it was a, it was, a, it was an incredible experience. I mean, when we were all staying in our, our little houses and, and going there, it really it almost started to feel like we were on the moon. And then these were the only other you know people on on Earth. And I think that. That helps uh, for the movie. It's a movie where this problem is an isolated and insulated issue. They, they, um, there's no kind of escaping it or running away from it. Their, their friend is in trouble. Their friend is asking for something impossible, and they're forced to deal with it. Yeah, no, completely, I agree. The big ask is from a first-time directing team. What are the benefits of that, challenges of that, and did you learn anything new from having fresh eyes on the material? Well, first of all, they, I mean, they were sort of, they, they sort of doled out their role, which helped a lot. Uh, Rebecca, for the most part, was more behind the camera and behind the monitor. She's a photographer, and so she worked really closely with the cinematographer and getting the, the look of the film and setting up shots and things like that. And Thomas, he wrote the script and is also an actor. He he talked to us more, and, and, and there was a little bit of crossover. And, you know, I mean, generally the challenges with having two directors is what can happen if there's a, a disagreement. Uh, or, you know, instead of serving one person's vision as a director, it can be complicated when two people are uh, disagree with each other or something like, like that. But for the most part, Thomas and Rebecca were completely on the same page with the movie they wanted to make. And it actually even helped sometimes, you know, when you when we were trying to 
muddle through some of these scenes that a lot of them are really complicated and you know some of the scenes if they're if they can be played wrong you know and if for instance i mean david was always amazing but just as an example if, if when david asked that question eventually if he had been in some kind of different space or more confident or more brash it would have set the whole movie off in a different tone so this was a very delicate movie and so it was nice to have um, sometimes be able to have a discussion where there were two opinions, and not only were there, there were two opinions, but because Thomas and Rebecca are so close and you know married in real life, they could really work with each other and with us to find the best option and and help us through it. Okay, cool. And uh, which character do you most relate with in real life, or which character do you feel is most like you out of the team? Oh, yeah. I, I would definitely say um, Owen. Just in terms of, you know, I I, I, I hope that I that am not uh, in my real life that in, insecure. Uh, but, yeah, when I read the script, that, that was really, you know, David loved the character of Andrew. Zach loved the character of Dave. And Owen was the one that made sense to me. The Owen, the one who's, are, is everybody serious? Is this actually going to happen? And and then, you know, when his when his girlfriend is considering it, I mean it just it's it's like all of his worst nightmares coming true. You know, he's created this little world for himself that works, but he always there's a there's a line at the beginning where you realize that Owen feels like uh you know, he says, To those of us to a vacation or for those of us that work at home, the indication being that both Dave and uh, Andrew both either have their own money or work at home, and Owen's the only one who has to like go out and work and make money. And I think that you know all of the little things that make him feel inferior in that group of friends anyway are just put under a magnifying glass with that. And it's like if you know, of course Dave's girlfriend isn't thinking about it, but if, you know, and of course my, uh, Owen's is. You, you know, like this is. This, of course, this would happen to Owen, and that his girlfriend would hear something like this and say, huh, maybe, I don't know, we'll see. So, I, you know, he, he acts out, but, but yeah, Owen, I definitely felt the close to then and now. Yeah, so he's certainly the best one for the audience to come into. We all kind of feel when Andrew initially announces what he announces, we all sort of feel like, well, that's crazy, you're not really going to do that, are you? So obviously Owen yeah. is the, is a great conduit for the audience to to get into the film that way. Um, well, look, thanks ever so much for giving uh, your time, Jason. Sorry if the connection was a bit awkward. Um, what oh, do you right. have coming up? Uh, just just let us know. Uh, well, there's there's also there's a movie called The I Am I that's also coming out on uh, the man, I think, uh, this week, and they have li uh, limited theatrical release, uh, so I'm excited for that, and uh, um, a movie, uh, uh, an independent movie called About Alex will be coming out in, in August, that was really fun uh, to make, and uh, what else is there? Uh, this movie Wild Canaries is sort of making the festival rounds, and I'm really proud of it, it's a really sort of <laughs> interesting uh Hey, it sort of starts off as a mumblecore movie, hipsters in New York, and then it turns into this sort of uh, suspense thriller, which uh, is a real nice turn and something kind of new and unexpected. And and then the other last thing is that I'm doing this, I do this um, sort of spooky mystery cartoon for the Disney Channel um, that's so much fun and I have so, such a great time with and uh, the second season for that is, is coming out and I, I can't wait for that to happen but I think that that's it now Wow, that's a lot on your plate so we'll look excellent work and uh, thanks so much for coming on the After Movie Diner today and uh, if any of those projects you want to talk about at a later date we'd love to speak to you again um, thanks again for putting up with the connection and uh, thank you for being on the show absolutely thank you so much
So just really leaves me then to sort of discuss my feelings on the movie and review the film, I guess. Unfortunately, we only had the one screener, and uh, I just kind of watched that online, so there's no one else to really discuss it with. So it's just going to be my thoughts. Overall, I really like the movie. I think the acting is really strong. I think the script in places is interesting, and I think the premise is really good. The direction is fine. I mean, it's absolutely fine. It, it's sort of what you expect from these Southern Californian-based, desert-based indie movies. I can't really describe what else I mean. There's nothing particularly stylistic to, you know, set it apart from from other films but there's nothing jarring unpleasant or uncomfortable about it either as you heard me in the interview say repeatedly the best thing that's on display here is the chemistry between the actors uh, obviously you've got six people who are attempting to portray three couples all of whom are going through their own kind of crisis uh, you've got uh, the one couple which is Hannah and Andrew, played by Melanie Linsky and David Crumholtz, respectively. And obviously Andrew is the one who makes the request. And you're not sure, uh, initially at the beginning of the film, how Hannah feels about this. You don't know whether she's going along with it, you don't know whether she's going to do it, you don't know if she's completely against it. Uh, it actually turns out that she thinks it's just something she's hoping he gets over in the weekend. But it's clear that, even though what he's asking is, you know, ridiculous to some extent, and I think it's very hard to get a handle on, even as well as David Krumholtz plays the role, and even as well as the role is written... It is difficult to get a handle on exactly how him having sex with his friends, girlfriends would really help. I chose to see the film as using that question as a way to highlight the fact that all the relationships in the story are flawed. And actually what Andrew needs is for these people or the people in his lives to be more honest and to be more open and to be more communicative with each other and by asking this thing which is designed to break them apart it is highlighting issues that there are in the relationship insecurities maybe someone likes someone else rather than the person they're with you know there is one couple in particular played by uh, Zachary Knighton and um, Anna O'Reilly and Anna O'Reilly is who plays Zoe, is sort of a bit of a free bird, and she's holding off accepting a proposal from Dave, Zachary Knighton's character. Uh, so this kind of gets her to examine exactly how she feels about her free will and lifestyle and whether she's ready to settle down. There's questions over whether Hannah, Andrew's girlfriend, is entirely right for Andrew and whether, in fact, she shouldn't be with another guy in the group. And there is, as Jason Ritter alluded to in his interview um, an issue with Gillian Jacobs character Emily his girlfriend who seems to be up for it seems to be you know we should help Andrew out and she seems to be on the level of sort of understanding where he's coming from so I found an emotional end to the movie I found a way to reconcile the the, the premise and reconcile the question he was asking and I enjoyed the film a lot more because of that I also completely and utterly responded to and understood his pain, his self-loathing, his need to feel uh, loved, his need to feel taken care of, his need to feel passion again and life again. I did understand that, and, and I, I completely, I completely recognised that. I just wasn't sure whether this would have been the answer. I was also unsure about the very end of the movie because, as I said, halfway through I kind of found my in with the emotional core of the film by saying, well, okay, actually what this question is doing is casting the cat amongst the pigeons and kind of highlighting the issues with their relationship and it's sort of forcing a lot of the unanswered questions and unanswered emotions and, and un unanswered situations um, in the six of them. It's forcing them out into the open and getting them all to deal with them. And I think the ending... It might have been more smug and might have been more clever, but it also might have been slightly more satisfying if that was sort of his whole point uh, to begin with or, or, if, or if that was actually what he was looking for. So he maybe started out thinking he needed the sex, but actually what he was really looking for was just a little bit more honesty in the group and to feel like he wasn't the only crazy person in the group. And the film certainly has that as, as its 
as as a message, but but it doesn't seem to be the core or the message completely. And I have to say, a lot of the other stuff I found a little difficult to empathize with or fully reconcile. But that's not to say that the performances aren't great, and it's not to say that the the situation isn't well played out, and it doesn't examine a lot of the different angles that something like this might stir up in a group of friends, because it certainly does. In fact, the two people we interviewed, and this is not because we interviewed them, but it's because it's genuinely true within the film, are incredibly strong in the film. I mean, David and Jason are really good in their characters. Um, You completely and utterly understand where they're coming from, and they're completely real in their performances as is Melanie Linsky, who has the sort of very difficult job of being the girlfriend who maybe hasn't been okay standing by him this whole time and maybe definitely is not okay with this question that he's posing and is sort of lost and confused and upset and maybe not in the right relationship herself, or at least that's how it comes across. But she's also got to kind of not look like a villain um, and not look like someone who's not standing by her guy. But at the same time, she's got to come across as, as you know, as a woman and as someone who's got to kind of find where she, she belongs in all this situation. And she has a really tough role in the movie and possibly the most complex role next to Jason's role, actually. And both of them do a great job, absolutely fantastic job. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't really applaud the acting much higher. The script is good. The script has a couple of moments where you're not really sure why they're in there you understand that it's trying to kind of summon up some sort of you know realistic situation or some sort of situation that you may you know you yourself may have been in or some kind of slice of life of this southern californian small village it really is it's really only like a bar in the desert and a couple of houses and things like that this sort of small community and there's a few sort of slice of life scenes with ned Beatty's old man who comes looking for his dog and French Stewart, who's the um, owner of the cabins and whose wife has left him and is a bit of an emotional and alcoholic wreck. And there's a whole bit with a dog where Andrew, who's David Krumholtz's character, has kind of kidnapped this dog to try and look for affection from the dog, to try and get affection from the dog, um, but also as a sort of sounding board for his own self-loathing. And that stuff really works very well. But then there is an incident that happens that I won't spoil that kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And and, and maybe I need to watch it again to kind of re-examine what that moment in the movie is trying to say about the, the emotions overall. But it's, 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 a, it's a strong debut. It's a really strong debut. I mean, you know, I had to bear in mind this is the first movie from a directing and married team. And um, I think it's one of his first scripts. And it's very strong for that. It doesn't break a huge amount of boundaries, and I think that the way it's being sold is the way that these studios or these um, marketing companies tend to sell these kind of indie films as sort of a a quirky, mumblecore cast of characters. We'll have a conflict, but we'll get through it in the end. And it's it's sort of it's a lot more sort of complex than that, and a lot a lot odder in places than that. I think what Andrew is going through is portrayed very well. I was certainly be I was certainly able to relate to a lot of it. Um, I really was, and I liked that about the film. But there are also some moments in it that don't don't particularly ring true either. So it's sort of a mixed bag in terms of that. I think that while the men and women have great chemistry and gel very well, I can't say I felt the same between the three guys. I knew why the three women were friends to some extent. Um, or certainly the dynamic within the three women's friend group. I can't say that I got the same kind of satisfaction for the dynamic with the guys. They were guys, you know what I mean? They had, like, rock fights and went out in the desert and danced around and drank and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it it, it wasn't... um, I can't say I got the male bonding element of it. But then, you know, the story is about, obviously, Andrew saying that he wants to sleep with these guys' uh, girlfriends, and so the guys would be thrown. You know, they wouldn't just openly accept that guys are um jealous and possessive and confused by emotion and so uh, a lot of that would would throw them i think and and so that makes some sense it's a very charming film but you've seen films like it let's not say it's bad but you've seen films like it it's um indie film set in the desert group of friends quirky soundtrack quirky trailer for the movie there's a dog in it there's emotions in it it's it's stuff you've seen before it doesn't mean that this movie doesn't deserve to do well. It does. It deserves to do really well. There's a lot of effort put into this film and um, a lot of great performances and a, and a great script. 
and I did enjoy it. It's just not one that I'm going to be putting in all the time because it's 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 not the kind of film that I tend to I tend to watch. And it's it's odd because I think late twenties to mid thirties kind of dramas are difficult to do. You know, we had that whole period of like the Brat Pack, and the moment they kind of grew up and tried to do sort of adult stuff like San Almo's Fire or About Last Night, it kind of comes off a bit cheesy in places if it's not done too well and then you have like the adult stuff um you know the 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 seemingly mature midlife crisis stuff um american beauty or most recently like august osage county kind of movies which are dramas ensemble dramas they're dealing with life and death and all that kind of stuff you know one of the big great examples is the big chill kind of thing but these sort of lately um 20s to 30s kind of dramas they're, they're kind of difficult to nail down. I mean, I understand what they're saying, and I appreciate that they're out there, because I do think that the emotions in there are relatable to anyone who's kind of gone through uh, loss or gone through confusion or gone through, you know, a need for for, for love and um, care and satisfaction and passion and things like that, which are not easy things to come by. So uh, I do appreciate them being out there, and I like to watch them. I mean, I get you know, through magnet releasing and companies like that, I do get sent the odd screener like this that I've mostly just reviewed on on the website um, as there normally isn't interviews and things tied to them. And they're not bad. I mean, I saw one recently that was called uh, Best Man Down, which was sort of a a dramedy, they call them. I don't like that word. But, you know, because they're just dramas, really. Dramas can have comedy in them. It doesn't mean that they are... You know, but anyway, um, it was a sort of drama comedy that wasn't bad. It wasn't great, but again, wasn't bad. Had some stuff to say. And before that, I had seen Love, Sex and Missed Connections, which was more of a comedy. That was more of your office space type where there is sweetness in it and there is romance in it. Um, but it is, for all intents and purposes, a comedy. And I certainly think the dramas are harder because they can't kind of fall back on stereotypes or... We hope they don't fall back on stereotypes. Whereas comedy, you can afford to have like the oafish, fat, bearded best friend and a lot of knob gags and things like that. Whereas a drama has to be, you know, more rooted in stuff that actually happens. And so they walk a fine line and it is difficult to get right. And I think the big ask gets it right more than it gets it wrong. Uh, I just don't know what the life of films like this are. That's all. I don't know. They're not movies. I don't, I don't think that they're movies that people collect uh, or that, 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 that have a long shelf life. They're not genre films, they're not mob films or a prison drama or something that might have a bit more um, entertainment appeal. They tend to be kind of raw and in your face and realistic and you want to engage with them on a certain level but you don't want to repeatedly engage with them, I don't think, because your life moves on. And while where I watch The Big Ask, my life currently is in a place where... Uh, although very different to the characters, I can completely relate to uh, the emotional needs that he has to some extent. And so it worked very well. But I don't know that 10 years from now I'm necessarily going to want to sit down and watch this film. So that's what I wonder about these indie movies. It's not that they're badly made and it's not that they're badly acted and not that that they're badly written or that they're of their time. Because they're not even of their time. I mean, this movie doesn't feel like a modern movie. This movie was made in the 90s. There was quite a few, like desert made dramas in the 90s if this was made in the 90s or made now it would you know it's it's absolutely fine it, it doesn't have to be of its time or anything so maybe each generation when they're in that frame of mind or in their mid to late 20s when it's confusing or in their 30s where it gets confusing or whatever they are maybe they pick up a movie like this but i think that's where the marketing of a film like this is to its detriment because it's a drama it's um it's meant to be engaged with emotionally it's not a laugh a minute um, when David Crumholtz does his job uh, as well as he does, it, you engage with it. You you empathize with him. You um, go on that journey with him. And so, yeah, I just wonder sort of what, what these... I understand the need to write these films when you feel this way about the world or about life or about an incident that happens to you. And I think that uh, they're perfectly legitimate. I just wonder sort of then what their life is. That's all. That's the only thing when I see a film like this. I wonder that. But no, very well done. Um, very well acted. Uh, very well well directed. And I would definitely, you know, if this crowd or, or if this director or if this director writing team do something again, I would definitely put it in and give it a chance. I think the studios need to stop being afraid of marketing a drama.
you know, even if you look at something like um, August Osage County, that's a drama. That's like a hard-hitting family drama. But that trailer for that movie is all comedy. It's all Meryl Streep saying little um, insults and things like that. So, yeah, difficult. But um, wonder a good movie, um, uh, definitely worth checking out on video on demand or when it comes out in theaters on May 30th. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this uh, one-off uh, episode. I think next week we're going to be uh, returning to a more sort of standard after movie diner structure. So enjoy that. And don't forget to check out the other interviews that we've done. Uh, we did Reggie Bannister last week, but we've spoken to in the past Fred Williamson, Cynthia Rothrock, uh, William Sadler, Brian Tyler, the composer, uh, Robert Davy. We've spoken to lots of different people on the show. So please do go back through our archives um, at uh, uh, amdpodcast.blogspot.com. That's where all the archives of all the episodes are from the last couple of years. So go to amdpodcast.blogspot.com, scroll back through and take a look at some of our interviews. And if you like um, the interviews on their own, without the rest of the show, you can actually go to aftermoviediner.com and click on the interviews tab and it will take you to a separate stream called Booth Talk from the After Movie Diner, which has just the interviews from the shows and I update them as and when I can I think I'm about four or five interviews behind so they won't have the most recent ones but I think we have up until the Fred Williamson uh, interview done separately because I have to re-edit them each time so uh, if you just want the interviews if you just like celebrity or acting or filmmaking interviews check them out and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, lots more in fact we've got uh, some coming up next week with um, Frank Lama and uh, Seth Hurwitz and, and uh, Robert Long all about Swarm of the Snakehead so uh, look out for that, enjoy that, and uh, I think we've even got an interview coming up on Doctor Action again, because we just did uh, Shari Shattuck and Richard Munchkin on there uh, for Out for Blood. So if you like 80s and 90s um, action movies, head over to DoctorActionKickass.blogspot.com. Lots to see. The best website to go to is AfterMovieDiner.com, and it's all there. All the links you need, all the tabs you need, all the streams you need are all there. So go check that out, AfterMovieDiner.com. Thanks ever so much for listening, and we'll be back next week with, I believe, Swarm of the Snakehead. We can still see a prison behind us is gathering its with a howl of silence, the cars unleashed, eyes flash with the certainty of war. But we can still see us escape to hell. We scream at our screaming wheels. The dog collar on the dashboard slides from left to right. The silence in the violence, nothing else is real. The last act of a dying octopus sun is to fill the sky with ink. And I can just watch and be still and not think. There are men, and then there are second unit podcast men. The podcast you've just been listening to. It's part of the Second Unit Podcast Network. Find all of our shows at 2upn.blogspot.com or on Facebook under the Second Unit Podcast Network. Our fantastic list of shows include Drunk on VHS, We Came from the Basement, No Budget Nightmares, The After Movie Diner, Dr. Action and the Kick-Ass Kid, and Blood Baths and Boomsticks. Take one podcast into the shower... Don't be a blithering idiot, Alan. We can give you the multiple podcast cleansing system all in one place that your hair deserves. Our programming is available across all platforms from iTunes to Podomatic, TalkShoe to Stitcher, so you have absolutely no excuse. 
Listen today and a free naked person of your choice will be shipped from Thailand to your door in a matter of weeks. The Second Unit Podcast Network. Bringing you the action and leaving the boring stuff to the other guys. Bloody hell. Who does a girl have to blow around here to get a decent beverage?